Today we're going to be observing the different properties of alcohols for this experiment. And what I'm going to start by doing is just looking at a simple solubility test in water. So water is going to have some solubility with alcohols in a lot of different ways, depending on um, whether or not the particular alcohol is, let's say, more reactive with water. Let's say if it has a, a pKa within a reasonable range that can react with water. Um, or if it has a big organic portion that's going to be less interested in spending time in water. Uh, even though, especially DI water, is not extremely ionic um, or charged compared to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, saltier water, something like that. So if we have just some uh, 2-methyl cyclohexanol, we can take a look at the molecule up here and you can actually see that it has a relatively large organic portion on it. And that's going to make it much less soluble than you would expect in water, but we can observe that and see if that's actually true. Because sometimes different uh, compounds might surprise you. So uh, let's get going. Got some of this 2-methyl cyclohexanol. What you want to be looking for is a phase boundary. You want to see two different layers which for two clear solutions might be a little difficult just do your best all right so for this particular compound our prediction came true and you can actually see pretty clearly a layer form there and that is an indication that these two even when you mix them up, are not gonna be very soluble. You can see all these bubbles or these uh, small uh, little cells form when you mix it up and it'll eventually settle out. That is like salad oil and uh, vinegar, just a good sign of insolubility. So this was our first sample out of the six. Let's kind of go through them a little faster. Next we have uh, one butanol. we close these up, make sure that they're nice and safe from contamination. One butanol, again, especially if you tap it, you can see it's not miscible. It might be very slightly miscible, but definitely not what you'd expect for it to be considered miscible. I, there's clearly a layer there. I would call this insoluble in water. All right. And then one hexanol. So is one hexanol going to be more polar or less polar than one butanol? I pose you this question. I answer you this question. Well, let's take a look at the results of the solubility test first and then the answer. So it looks like we have a pretty strong layer there Again, if you mix it up or try to mix it up, you're gonna get lots of little cells in there, little bubbles due to them, to them being quite insoluble. And you would expect that one hexanol would be even less soluble in water probably than one butanol. Why? Because there's a bigger, not, there's a much bigger nonpolar region on one hexanol. All right, on to the next test. 2-propanol, also known as isopropyl alcohol. For those of you who lived through the great pandemic of 2020, this might be a familiar compound to you. And you may have used it in an aqueous solution. So it appears to be totally soluble. You don't see any layer here. And that's what you'd expect. Usually if you go to the store and you buy alcohol for disinfecting, it is often going to be 2-propanol, sometimes it's ethanol, but usually it's just isopropyl alcohol. And it is comfortably in an aqueous solution, often set, found at 70% for disinfecting purposes. All right, 
totally soluble for that one. The sample number four. So, next sample, sample number five, is turd butyl alcohol. So when you look at the structure of turd butyl alcohol, it's not quite as long as the other chains of alcohols, but it, it does have a nice solid nonpolar region. And so we will see in practice whether that pays off. So, it appears to be mostly soluble. It's not, it's definitely forming some small bubbles and it seems pretty hesitant about being soluble with this water. Um, there might be, so I would say it's, it's mostly miscible but not perfectly miscible. So it's slightly insoluble, I'm sure. I see some little bubbles in there and some distortion in the liquid uh, when I mix it. An unexpected result for me, in my, my opinion, no doubt. Or at least based on the general concepts here. All right, last but not least, phenol. You want to be extra careful with phenol. This is like the only really dangerous one here. Um, pretty nasty sometimes. And burn stuff and dissolve stuff. Let's see how it reacts with that water. Well, whether it mixes, at least. Will it mix? It wasn't very exothermic, so that's nice. So it appears to be also fully soluble. And you would expect that for phenol. Phenol is going to actually have um, a pKa uh, that's going to be much lower than the other alcohols, which is going to make it less uh, or it's going to be more vulnerable to forming um, ions and disassociating. And uh, so that's going to be a valuable property to mingle well with water. Water loves to form ionic compounds. So this is fully soluble, not even a trace of any kind of strange bubbles or insoluble, immiscible chunks. So number six, phenol, 100%. All right. So far, which of these were actually soluble? So the ones that were the most soluble were probably isopropyl alcohol, number four, and phenol, number six. So if you look at all of these, uh, this one was probably the closest to being somewhere in between. Um, and these three were definitely not soluble in water. And that makes sense because these are gonna be probably the most polarizable and these are gonna be the least polarizable because they have such large nonpolar regions. And that's gonna make them less interested in acting with a relatively polar compound like water. All right. On to the next test. So next we're gonna do the Lucas test. We're gonna take the Lucas reagent, and we're gonna add just a little bit of it to each of these test tubes, which I've already filled with a sample of each of these individual reagents. And it's important to consider whether you have a one prime, two prime, or three prime alcohol for each of these tests. Uh, and it's worth taking note before you actually observe which reagent uh, is working, or which, uh, of these samples the Lucas reagent will be working with. So for the first compound, uh, 2-methylcyclohexanol, we're going to be looking at the alcohol and its position. Is it primary, secondary, or tertiary? So if you guessed secondary, you'd be correct. That's gonna be two prime. So I can write that up on the board. Then we're going to take the one butanol and also we'll look at the one hexanol at the same time. What would you guess for those? So they're both going to be primary. We'll make note of that. Then we're gonna look at the isopropyl alcohol or two propanol. That's gonna be a two 
this is going to be tertiary, and this is going to be neither or none of all of these. So phenol is going to be a little different. It's kind of like the wild card, just because of the way that it has actually an aryl structure attached to it instead of any kind of alkyl structure. Okay, so um, we chalk that up to sp2 hybridization uh, differences. So here we go, we'll take this first sample and we'll take the Lucas reagent. And it's important to look for the initial reaction, but sometimes the reaction might not happen immediately, so we'll also take a look at it after a few minutes. solution is a little cloudier, but nothing too obvious has happened yet. I'm trying to see if it got warmer. It doesn't seem to be that much warmer. It might be a little cloudy. We'll check we'll check on it in a couple minutes. Next sample number two. Take some of that Lucas reagent and add it in. Again, we're not seeing much of anything. This appears to be miscible, it's just mixing up together and not changing color whatsoever. Sample number three. Remember, the last sample was also one prime or primary. And so is this one. Virtually no effect whatsoever. We'll check on it again in a couple minutes, but nothing. A big blank. All right, number four, isopropyl alcohol, two prime, secondary. Looks like something might be happening in there. Hard to say. So we'll check on that one in a little bit. Then we have sample five. This one's tertiary, so it's a little different than all the other ones so far. Let's take a look. So it looks like this is definitely doing something. Something definitely happened when I mixed this together before. We will see in a second whether or not that becomes any further reaction. And last but not least, all. That didn't appear to react either. And this uh, terpetyl alcohol um, is going to be the sample that we would expect to interact with the Lucas agent and because I mixed it a little too aggressively last time, it probably just came, went back into solution. But you can see now that you sort of have this cloudy precipitate at the bottom, and that's a sign that this is a positive test for the Lucas reagent. So over time, eventually, the other samples that are secondary may likely actually react 
Um, and so it might be a little bit more subtle than this one. This one is a clear positive for the lupus reagent. So it's time to do the iron chloride test. So this time we're working with a solution of 1% iron 3 chloride. And we're just gonna be seeing whether or not it interacts with any of these alcohols. So one thing that you might think about uh, as differences between any of these particular alcohols is that only one of these is relatively acidic. That one is going to be namely the phenol, uh, which is sample number six. Um, it's hard to necessarily figure out, you know, a whole lot of this from just looking at the boiling point or melting point of any of these alcohols. You really do need to mix them with some kind of other chemicals to observe some kind of reaction. And um, in this case, metal reactions with the phenol or with any of these other alcohols will be able to tell us a positive or negative test for the properties of the compound itself. All right, so here we go. So we had a tiny bit. Keep in mind that the color of the 1% iron chloride is a white yellow color, so if we see any of these colorless samples take on that color, probably nothing unusual happened other than this just got mixed into the samples. All right, so here we go. Just put a couple of drops. solution so it's not going to be extremely visible with, with the ones that we already observed for the solubility tests to be insoluble with water. Something to keep in mind. Mixing it well there with the isopropyl. test that we will be able to talk a little bit more about later but carefully take note of each of these reactions whether they happen or not and you can probably note quickly that there's only one real clear distinct reaction that took place okay so on to the last test we're gonna be going through some of some of these uh, different compounds with uh, a way to oxidize them. So we're gonna be using today a little bit of KMNO4 solution, 1%, um, and we're also gonna pre-treat that with a little bit of hydrochloric acid to protonate any extra um, alcohols that we have or any of the alcohols that are in these compounds individually. Um, and their different structures are going to potentially give different results due to how prone they are to being oxidized. So are there going to be hydrogens around that are available to be oxidized or removed? Um, and is the compound going to be structurally able to be oxidized? That's worth considering for this particular reaction. So what we'll do is we'll take a little bit of hydrochloric acid, we'll add three drops to each of these well plates, and that will get this started. And now that we've added those three drops of hydrochloric acid, we'll let it sit for a second. See if we notice any changes. Alcohols in general are just not very reactive uh, a lot of the time. So oxidation is a great way to turn them into something more useful like a ketone or an aldehyde maybe. typically have a pretty high pKa too, so they're not really easily deprotonated for any reason. So then, we're going to take this KMNO4 solution, and we're going to observe each of these individual reactions in each of these well plates. So it's going to be, this row is going to be 1, 2, and 3, and this row is going to be 1, Two, or sorry, four, five, and six. So 
one, two, three, four, five, and six are the samples from before, and I'll try to name the, the samples as we go through the metrics. So let's see. Keep in mind that the solution already is a dark purple. So for the two methyl cyclobutanol, or sorry, uh, the two methyl cyclohexanol, here we go. Okay. Then for the one butanol, for the one hexanol, for the two propanol, or the isopropyl alcohol. And then let's say for the 2-methyl-2-propanol, terbutyl alcohol. And for the, finally, the phenol. KMNO4 solution was a purple color and it appears so if you can see in here it's quite purple and if you look back at the samples this sample in particular for the 2 methyl propanol is going to be not barely changed in color at all the rest of these appear to have all changed individually and it's expected that you'll probably have a less sterically hindered alcohol, which has hydrogens available for oxidation, so these make sense. The phenol is more of a mystery here, but phenol also has a variety of different reactivities because it's an aromatic alcohol. This is our final test, so make sure you pay attention to the original color, so you may need to rewind for that, and the final color of each of these reagents and mixtures, in this case, which didn't react. And uh, include that in all of your lab notebook um, spaces for the colors. All right, well, I'll uh, see you the next reaction.